Hello Year 8, this is a guidance video for your end of topic assessment. Your end of topic assessment is going to be on biology chapter 10. This is the first one. So you should be able to see a screen, something similar to this. And this will count towards your final grade. This is one of two assignments that we're going to be setting you. Please make sure that you are well prepared before completing this. That's going to be the objective of this whistle stop tour of chapter 10. So you're not going to be able to use any resources or get any help to complete this assessment. You must make sure that you've completed all the questions before you press submit. If you make a mistake, it's not going to be something that we can reverse very easily. So the topics that you need to revise for this test are in your textbook. They are uh, in the biology section at the start pages 32 to 39. You must complete this revision before taking the test. You will not be able to access this info. You're not going to be able to use any resources or get any help to complete this. You have to do it on your own. You must make sure that you've completed all the questions before submitting. And you'll only receive one opportunity to submit this work. Now the test should take no less than 30 minutes. Please do not rush it. It's a really important test. It means that every single mark is actually going to be very, very important for you to get as many marks as possible. Um, as many marks as possible is what you should be aiming to, to get. So don't rush the test. The, the, you know, it's, it's, you're going to have to think about every single one. And it, you will be nervous, but you know if you do get stuck, just just pause this. It should take no longer than thirty minutes, but if you need to just pause and think, just by all means, you know, do it. This test is not timed, so no other work will be set for my subject as it is the holy month of Ramadan. It's very important that you complete the test on your own and in your own words, without having access to search engines on the internet. Uh, such as Google, textbooks, copybooks, you know, it's just anyone uh, that is there that can help provide tests with uh, answers with te uh, tests at home. Going to make sure that if you, uh, if we find that there are written answers taken from the internet or if they're exact copies of answers from other students or maybe even some mark schemes that that may have been discovered. You need to be aware that these answers may not be counted. It's going to be very, very easy for us. Now you realise that. We've been through these lessons. We, we go through the lessons with all of the answers on the spreadsheet. So we can see, we can filter uh, which answers are similar. So it's going to be very, very easy for us to spot where people have been working together. So you are not allowed to work together at all for this. The spelling will not matter unless it's absolutely vital. So for example, if you need to spell the name virus, uh, you, you, you know, as long as it looks like virus, it's fine. Um, but if you spell microbe uh, with an with an N and with an with an with a Y at the start, it's it's not obvious what the, the actual word is. So we're going to we're going to uh, be confused by that, and it's it's going to be important for you to make sure that the spellings of those types of words are important, or if it's the name of a chemical. Please do not share these questions with anyone else. You might uh, be tempted to share them with your friends. Um, you know, you you want to do them a favor. You want to stay good friends. This is not something that will will help them. Um, we want to be able to see where the weaknesses are. And we want this to be fair. So remember the SCF competencies of independence, honesty, and integrity, and you know the best of luck with this. So here's a whistle stop tour. So we started off in this chapter with variation. Uh, thinking about biodiversity. Biodiversity is the wide range of different living organisms that exist, from daisies to giraffes. Okay. Um, we were looking at 
features of living organisms and there's quite a bit of variation, variation differences between these organisms. Uh, much of this is due to inherited factors or genetic factors which come from uh, parents, but it's also environmental variation. So you can think of uh, genetic factors, inherited factors, inherited variation, genetic variation, but also environmental variation due to environmental factors such as the amount of food available, which would affect how large animals would grow. So we start thinking about species, make sure you know what the word species is. They are organisms that are very closely related. So they belong to small groups called species and members of a species, organisms of species, can successfully breed with each other and produce fertile offspring. But if you have uh, different species breeding together, uh, they will produce offspring, but they, the offspring will not be able to have offspring themselves. So you can have uh, different members of the same species and you can have variation within the same species. So there's wide variation between different breeds of these dogs, for example. Latin names that are given to species. The first part is called the genus, and then the second part is called the uh, species. So we should be able to see um, organisms within a species have similarities, but uh, there may be some variation between them, okay? Might be down to some genetic variation, it might be down to environmental va variation, but if these uh, dogs, for example, and they belong to the same species, if these dogs were, a, were allowed to breed, they would uh, make puppies, their offspring, and those puppies would then be able to have puppies themselves, so they belong to the same species. Okay, so Moving on to the second section. Second section is about genes, chromosomes, and DNA. No, you've got to realise and you've got to know how how big they are compared to each other. So, this is the largest structure, which is the cell. Inside the cell, you have a nucleus, and inside the nucleus, you have chromosomes. And there are twenty-three pairs of chromosomes in the human. Uh, human in, in a human adult cell, 23 pairs. It's only in the gametes, the sex cells of eggs and sperm, that they have 23. So, 23. So, there are normally 23 pairs, which make up 46 chromosomes in a normal cell of a human being. But in the sex cells, there are... 23 chromosomes. Now on the chromosome you would have a section, a small section, that would be called a gene. Okay, so genes, these genes are the units of inheritance and they carry the genetic information that control the characteristics that this cell belongs to, this, the organism that this cell belongs to. And genes make up the chromosomes and the nuclei of cells and they only become visible under a microscope when the cell is about to divide. Now these chromosomes are long molecules of DNA, okay, and the specific areas of DNA on each chromosome are called genes, and these genes contain information that codes for specific proteins, and some of these proteins are enzymes, and they help regulate all the chemical reactions that take place inside this cell. And different species have different numbers of organisms, so a hedgehog cell would actually have 88 chromosomes, 44 pairs, Broccoli has nine pairs of chromosomes, which make 18. And humans have 46 chromosomes of each of our cells, 23 pairs. And you can arrange them in pairs. And here's how they are arranged, okay? So you'll notice that these are two sets. This one belongs to a man and this one belongs to a, a, a woman. And you can actually see that one pair of chromosomes looks like it. Uh, an X and a Y, and this one over here looks like an X and an X, and this is this is actually how the that's actually the dif difference, the genetic difference between uh, male and female human beings. So genetic information, we pass this genetic information from one generation to the next. Okay, one one of these chromosomes. So this is actually from um, 
from a human cell. That's, and one of these chromosomes would actually be passed on. This genetic information would be passed on from the mother. And then one of these would be passed on from the father. Okay. If we get, if we get uh, knowledge of this, this helps us understand how characteristics are inherited from both natural parents during uh, reproduction. And the history of the genetic uh, developments we studied in your scrapbooks. So at the start, cells were discovered when microscopes were used in the 17th century. And then by the 19th century, scientists said all living things were made of cells. And then in the 1860s, Gregor Mendel did experiments on inheritance in peas. He suggested that these were things that these were things in cells that acted as units of inheritance by being passed from one generation to the next. And by 1910, the term gene had been introduced and fruit fly chromosomes were being mapped, they were being looked at and mapped to find the location of these genes. By the 1940s, we knew that DNA sounded, uh, found in cell nuclei was the chemical of inheritance in the 1950s. James Watson, Francis Crick with Morris Wilkins and Ro Rosalind Franklin worked out that the structure of DNA was this double helix, like a spiral next to a spiral with rungs of a ladder twisted. In the 1970s, the first gene was sequenced, and in the 1990s, the Human Genome Project began to identify all the human genes that work out their sequence on the chromosomes, and that was completed in 2003. The Human Genome Project is a, has a complete list of human genes Humans have about 20,600 genes in their cells. Moves on to natural and artificial selection. So Charles Darwin, his work coined uh, the term uh, of being the father of the theory of evolution. He lived during the 19th century, the 1800s. Sorry, the 1800s, yeah, the 19th century, and made detailed observations of plants and animals. He put, together, put forward his theory of evolution by natural selection, and it was published in 1859 in a book called On the Origin of Species. So, basically, his, his theory was that competition between organisms leads to development of adaptations. In any population, there's a wide variation between organisms of the same species, due to differences in their genes. Now, some variations may be advantageous. For example, giraffes could have, uh, some giraffes could have a uh, variation and they have longer necks and they can reach for uh, the tops of trees. So his theory suggested that this variation, this type of variation could be advantageous. If there's competition between the giraffes, those with the advantage, advantageous characteristics will be uh, more likely to succeed. And that is sometimes coined survival of the fittest. Now, those, ex those organisms that survive, they then breed, and his theory relied upon those genes being passed on from one generation to another for the useful characteristics to their offspring. And then over time, only the organisms with these useful characteristics survive. Okay, so... Some scientists have used this to explain how tigers have survived in the wild, how they hunt, and it looks as if they've got camouflage there. Um, so ancestors of the tiger with striped coats would be yet less likely to be seen in the long grass and they could hunt better and more efficiently. And maybe those Striped animals would therefore be more likely to catch prey. If they had more food, they would survive and they would breed. Those stripes would be passed on. And then over time, those striped animals would then exist. Now, evolution usually takes place very slowly. That we know. But perhaps if there's a gene that suddenly appears in a species, there may be a rapid change if the environment and change in species of the environment species um, if the environment changes and one example of this is head lice so if there's a resistance to a particular insecticide then what that head lice will do is that head lice will survive and then breed and then pass on that gene for resistance to the next generation so the head lice then rapidly evolves and that could be killed by a particular insecticide to insecticide-resistant head lice. 
Okay, so the headlice had rapidly evolved from headlice that could be killed by that insecticide to headlice that are now resistant. Now we've seen this and we've studied this also in um, antibiotics. Well, artificial selection was something that we come up with, it's the opposite, it's where you have the interference from a human, some also called selective breeding by artificial selection. We studied camels and the UA link for that was um, camel milk. So if a species does not survive, uh, it could be endangered. Now there could be um, different factors, there could be uh, the impact of humans. Uh, here's a dodo. Now, dodos are not existing. Okay, we haven't seen them. And it was a large flightless bird, and people think that it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't down to people eating the birds that existed in Mauritius, but they thought that dodos laid their eggs and nests on the ground so these could be eaten by cats and rats. So a species has to become endangered first, and then if they cannot find another, if their population goes down, they can't find um, uh, a spouse to, to to mate with, then they, 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 they can't breed anymore, and then that could cause them to become extinct. So we looked at some UAE um, organisms, UAE local organisms that could, that were endangered. Um, so things that can change, uh, changes can lead to extinction. Now, in long term, it could be global warming, okay, catastrophic event, new predators is usually what uh, is a popular answer, new compet competitors, disease or the actions of humans. So we, we studied that. And we looked at how scientists are hoping to preserve hereditary material of organisms before they become extinct through cryobanks, gene banks, and seed banks. So we did a lesson on that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, it's pretty much it for, um, for the test. There's some information at the end of the chapter to stretch and challenge you with the theory of evolution. And best of luck with the test. It's, uh, remember, it's something that you have to do honestly with integrity and independently. So do not work with anyone else. Don't, don't look at the answers. We're just, I'm just interested in how you're doing. Okay. And best of luck with the test. I look forward to marking it. And if there are any mistakes that you've made, I'll be able to go through them in your next Google Meet. Thanks for watching. Make sure you take the test only when you are comfortable and when you're fully prepared. And remember that the test is something that you have to take in one go. So you can't stop the test and then carry on, okay? Best of luck, bye for now, stay safe, and Ramadan Kareem.